thank you so much for welcoming me here to Madrid and for providing me with such a magnificent arena to present to you this evening my lecture on the Testimonio de la Gran Armada contra Inglaterra, the 1588 and La Costa Irlandesa, Actualidad y Perspectivas para una Necesaria Revisión. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I also express my sincere gratitude to His Excellency the Duke of Tetuan, Don Hugo O'Donnell, Duque de Estrada, for the honor of inviting me to participate in this splendid cycle of lectures hosted by the Royal Academy of History to the Fundación Ramón Areces. I appreciate this opportunity very much, and I hope to live up to your expectations this evening also, I wish to thank the members and staff of both the Royal Academy of History and the Fundación Ramón Areces for their generosity and their discreetly effective organization of this event. May I present my discourse to you in three parts. First, I shall comment on the English national myth of the Armada's defeat and decline of Spain, and then I shall deal with the responses to the Armada in Ireland and what really happened there. And finally, I shall speak about the archaeological recoveries from the Irish coast and what perspectives they provide for us in our understanding and interpretation of the Armada of 1588. And so, this is the, the memory of the great dramatic events in the history of peoples, of nation states, of empires, of federations. It is preserved and communicated through generations, through various means, principally through oral tradition or through the recording of folk memory or through contemporary written accounts by chroniclers. In most cases, fact and fiction are mixed, and one must be aware of political or religious agendas or propagandas being pursued. Any objective interpretation of such forms of popular memory requires careful, critical, and rigorous examination. And this can be done also in combination with forensic analysis of archival and, where relevant, archaeological evidence. All available empirical evidence, when analyzed in its full context and compared with oral tradition, occasionally confirms, but more frequently reveals, the weaknesses and faults of folk memory. In this regard, over the past 30 years, since the international conferences and exhibitions in 1988 that commemorated the 400th anniversary of the Armada against England, recent discoveries in both sets of reliable empirical evidence, archival and archaeological sources, as well as in DNA mapping projects, have revolutionized and revised our understanding of what actually happened concerning the enterprise of England in 1588 and its legacy upon the coasts of Scotland and Ireland. For some English and Irish Catholics, the failure of the Armada to accomplish its mission in England was a sign that God in his infinite wisdom had decided to test their faith further. We know that Philip II of Spain regarded it with stoic equanimity and ordered requiem masses and prayers for the dead, and he organized medical care for those who returned sick and wounded and material assistance for the destitute. This, ladies and gentlemen, was in sharp contrast to the euphoria among English and Dutch Calvinists who regarded it as a sign of divine approval and proof that they were God's elect, God's chosen people, and worthy heirs of Moses, of Joshua, and of Judas Maccabeus. Thus, sermons were published 
coins were struck, and images were depicted with such allegories from the bloodier passages of the Old Testament, whereby the Spanish and their forces drawn from various nationalities were depicted as the Amalekites, the Egyptians, the Persians, and the Philistines, the enemies of the ancient Hebrews, God's chosen people. The Calvinists love the Old Testament. Even the English queen regnant, Elizabeth I, allowed herself to be depicted as Gloriana, the glorious victor in the famous Armada portrait of her by an unknown English painter. Yet, she did very little to help her own mariners, soldiers, or volunteers who had been injured or wounded in the skirmishes with the Spanish Armada in St. George's Channel or off the coast of Flanders. The archival evidence, as presented by Professor Geoffrey Parker, among others, reveals that Elizabeth's own admiral, Howard of Effingham, and officers such as Sir John Hawkins and Sir Martin Frobisher wrote letters urging her to be compassionate and provide assistance to those who had served her and who were now dying in the streets of her southern coastal towns. They had to help those unfortunates out of their own pockets. Significantly, Howard and Hawkins even complained that Sir Francis Drake had not come to their aid in the height of the skirmish, but instead he had plundered a supply ship that had stranded on a sandbank in the Solent. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, in English nationalist consciousness and popular historical memory to this very day, it is Elizabeth I who is celebrated as the great heroine, who stood up for what they call the true reformed faith and English liberties. And Drake is still celebrated as her champion, the national hero, who according to English folk memory, went out to defeat the Spanish Armada after he played a game of bowls and smoked his pipe. Even the legend of Drake's drum that would sound and summon Drake's ghost to defend England from future danger was invoked by the Leave side during the Brexit referendum of 2016. It was with a delicious sense of wicked wit and humor that Felipe Fernandez Armesto has so convincingly illustrated the enduring influence of the notion of the Armada's defeat in the English historical narrative. England's special place in divine providence informed the subsequent thinking of 17th century Calvinists in English political life, especially in that regicide, the Lord Protector of England's Republican Commonwealth, Oliver Cromwell. During the 1640s and 1650s, his foreign policy towards Spain was still colored by fears of another attempted invasion of England or extermination of his fellow Protestants in continental Europe by what he regarded as the Spanish Antichrist. Yet by the 18th century, when the kingdoms of England and Scotland were united to form Great Britain, and the Anglo-Hanoverian monarchy was attempting to secure its grip on the British throne against the claims of the Stuart pretenders supported by Bourbon France and Spain, the English myth of Elizabeth I and Drake's repulsive invasion from continental Europe assumed a new but more secularized influence. So, now the religious overtones of the late 16th and early 17th century portrayals of the Armada were replaced with the accent of constitutional parliamentary party politics defeating royal absolutism as represented by the Bourbon dynasty in France. The arbitrariness of the former Elizabethan regime 
was just as much as the constitutionalism of the juramentos that bound Philip II to the cortes of his kingdoms and principalities that formed his monarchy, these were conveniently ignored in this new transformation that suited the Whig or Liberal Party's agenda. It was only in the 19th century, following the final defeat of Napoleon in 1815, that Britain began to expand her overseas possessions in Africa and South Asia. It was only then that by any objective and empirical standards could she claim to rival the former expanse of the Spanish monarchia. Yet her historians and political apologists, such as James Anthony Froude, or John Knox Lawton, or William Henry Carley Wright, undertook a most remarkable feat of historicist propaganda by claiming that Britain's rise to the status of the world's leading maritime power began with what they described as the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, or as Wright called it, Britain's Salamis, an event they described as the beginning of the decline of Spain. And so the British thought of themselves as the ancient Athenians, defeating the Persians. The historical facts that Spain continued to be a major power with flourishing culture, trade, and scientific achievements right through the 17th and 18th centuries, and that even the Dutch became a major maritime power and flourished as such up until the 1790s, seemed not to register with British historians nor indeed with some of their French counterparts. And it is in this regard that we must note that the liberal dominated party political system in Westminster and its monarch's powers curtailed by parliament was the envy of many political liberals in 19th century Europe. And while the British form of liberalism was skeptical towards religion, the French form of liberalism was hostile towards it and highly critical of traditional social mores and attitudes that were influenced to a considerable degree by Catholicism. Thus, the Armada of 1588 assumed yet another mythological symbolism, that of being representative of the alleged politico-religious obscurantism in the narratives of 19th century historians who identify themselves as progressive in Britain and France, and their influence percolated into Spanish society also. That symbolism, ladies and gentlemen, found itself expressed in the deliberately ironic phrase that was then invented, La Armada Invencible, by Cesareo Fernandez Duro in 1884-85. Similar condescending attitudes among the British 19th century establishment towards their somewhat troublesome and recalcitrant Irish neighbors, especially Irish political activists, found expression in the portrayal of the Armada 1588 and its history. The Irish who had joined the Armada were portrayed as frenzied religious fanatics, and the survivors of the Armada shipwrecks who came ashore were either robbed or killed by Irishmen who were portrayed as equally frenzied in their lust for robbing and killing. Such depictions served a political purpose at that time too that the Irish were incapable of self-government and decent society, never mind being trustworthy. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we come to examine the actual evidence. And there on the map you see 14 identified wreck sites, but it is debatable whether there were 24 or 26 altogether, but these 14 have been formally identified on the coast. What were the responses to the Armada in Ireland? What really happened? It is well known that Elizabeth I's Lord Deputy of Ireland, Sir William Fitzwilliam, reacted hysterically to news of Spaniards coming ashore on Ireland's north and west coasts in September of 1588. Fitzwilliam was a fervent Calvinist, and he had previously served with the Dutch rebels against Alba and Requesens 
in the Habsburg Netherlands. Fearing a combination of Spanish troops, some of whom were Irish veteran soldiers in the Spanish service, and aware of the disaffected Irish lords and those forces combining, Fitzwilliam ordered that no survivors from the Armada shipwrecks were to be spared. Fitzwilliam personally led his troops all the way from Dublin into the northwest of Ireland, where he feared the formation of yet another Spanish-Irish alliance. Ladies and gentlemen, Fitzwilliam's order for no mercy to be shown is indicative of just how insecure the English administration in Ireland was at that time. Only five years earlier, the Second Desmond War from 1579 to 83 against Elizabeth's regime in Southern Ireland had ended. Philip II had supported Desmond with money, arms, ammunition, and Spanish volunteer troops. It was only in 1585 that the Elizabethan regime had finally begun to confiscate Desmond lands and plant them with English colonists. This process had aroused much unease against the remaining Irish Catholic nobility. That's just three years before the arrival of the Armada. The English governor in Connacht, Sir Richard Bingham, and his brother George, also fervent Calvinists, they too, like Fitzwilliam, had served with the Dutch rebels against Parma. The Binghams displayed a particularly ruthless ferocity in this matter, as indeed did their subordinate, an Irishman called Boethius Clancy, known as the axe-wielding ghoul of West Clare. The Elizabethan governor of Kerry, Sir Edward Denny, showed similar ruthlessness. He was a first cousin of Elizabeth's spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham. And Denny's wife, Lady Margaret, proved to be just as ruthless as her husband. In his absence, not only did she seize the Duke of Medina Sidonia's valuable baggage from a small supply ship that sheltered in Tralee Bay, she had the entire crew hanged including the Duke's two trusted servants, despite the offer of a ransom from their friends among the mercantile patriciate in the port city of Waterford. They say that the female is the deadlier of the species. Nevertheless, in Galway, of those survivors from the Falco Blanco Mediano, La Concepcion, and El Gran Grin, who were taken prisoner, Ten Spaniards, including a young cabin boy, were saved, hidden and spirited out of Galway by its citizens, particularly its women folk. They were outraged at Bingham's treatment and execution of those whom he had taken prisoner. Indeed, the ladies of Galway's mercantile patriciate insisted on giving the dead Spaniards a decent Catholic burial. There you have one of the monuments. This is the old memorial to the Armada dead at Fort Hill, formerly St. Augustine's Priory in Galway. And then in 1988, on the 400th anniversary of the Armada, another memorial was placed in the same cemetery in Galway, Fort Hill. And this was again part of the commemoration of the very close links that bind Galway with Spain. And while the women of Galway had arranged Catholic burials for the Spanish, their husbands sent information to the governor of Galicia concerning how things were turning out in Ireland, as well as news and reports on the activities of the distinguished commander Don Alonso de Leyva. And it was in that context that De Leva and 700 of his men holding out in North Connacht gave hope to Philip that all was not lost for the Armada survivors in Ireland. Alas, 
Despite de Leva's heroic efforts to escape to Scotland, he and his men drowned in La Girona, wrecked off the Antrim coast. And it should be noted that concerns among Galway's mercantile patriciate to distance themselves from Bingham's massacre of Spaniards might not have been solely motivated by moral outrage or Catholic sensibilities with their co-religionists. Many of these families had close links, especially with the port cities of San Sebastian, Santander, El Ferrol, La Coruña, Lugo, Oporto, Lisbon, and Cadiz. Galway's primary and most lucrative overseas market, ladies and gentlemen, was Spain. Fitzwilliam suspected Sir Hugh O'Donnell, Lord of Tyrconnell, of sympathy with the Spanish. And therefore, English troops were sent into Tyrconnell, that's up in the northwest of Ireland, Donegal. And while O'Donnell himself was forced by the English to remain aloof, many members of his clan helped survivors who came ashore to escape to Scotland. Those who were less fortunate were promptly killed by Fitzwilliam's troops. And it should be remembered that at that time, O'Donnell's son, Red Hugh, was held a hostage by the English in Dublin Castle. And following his escape, Red Hugh more than compensated Spain with his allegiance and service to Philip II and Philip III during the Nine Years' War from 1594 to 1603. And after the father abdicated the lordship in favor of Red Hugh, he entered the Franciscan friary in Donegal as a lay brother, as he said, it was in reparation for his inability to rescue those Armada survivors who had been captured by Fitzwilliam. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a very touching indication of how the tragedy had affected his conscience. Let us look now at two quotations from Lord Deputy Fitzwilliam's correspondence with his masters in London during this time. And this ties in with my introductory remarks about English intentions and propaganda. On the 28th of October, 1588, Fitzwilliam wrote to the English Privy Council that, the Spaniards worketh much in the hearts of the Irishry, which I will labor to remedy. In other words, the Spaniards much, worketh much is a lovely old 16th century phrase, worketh much in the heart means loved or affection. So the Spaniards are loved in the hearts of the Irish, which I will try to undermine. Hence the order no quarter, do not spare anyone. In another letter to Lord Burley, Elizabeth's Secretary of State and Lord High Treasurer, Fitzwilliam wrote that, the Spaniards go favored and succored by the country people, as it will be hard to hunt them out, but with long time and great labor. In other words, Fitzwilliam is saying, that the Spanish are helped and favored by the people in the countryside. And therefore, it will be very difficult for him to hunt down the Spaniards. It's going to take him considerable time and much effort. Elizabeth's Secretary of State for Ireland, Sir Geoffrey Fenton, observed Fitzwilliam's and Bingham's massacre of Armada survivors on the shores of Connacht and southwest Donegal. And he wrote to Lord Burley that he hoped that they would raise a difference between the Spaniards and the Irish so long as the memory of the present transactions shall endure. In other words, raise enmity between the Spanish and the Irish as long as memory of the slaughter would continue. These quotations tell us a lot about the hopes and intentions of the English officials in Ireland at that time. But as we know, ladies and gentlemen, 
the friendship between the Spanish and the Irish continued to endure. During the 1590s and early 1600s, colleges specifically dedicated for the education of Irish Catholics were established under royal patronage in Salamanca, Santiago de Compostela, Alcalá de Henares, Seville, and Madrid. It was not until 1952, when the last of these colleges was closed, since the beginning of the 16th century, English foreign policy tried to undermine the traditional friendship between the Spanish and the Irish, since both had favored a political union, since James, Earl of Desmond, transferred his allegiance from Henry VIII to Charles V and I in a treaty signed with the Emperor King's envoy, Don Gonzalo Fernández de Córdoba, at Dingle on the 28th of April, 1529. The rights and privileges granted to the Irish and Habsburg territories in that treaty continued to be joined or to continue to be enjoyed by the Irish in Spain until 1952, in the Habsburg Netherlands until in 1793, and in Austria until 1919. And there on the screen you see a 16th century proverb with the map, he who would England win must with Ireland begin. And this weighed very much on the minds of the Tudor monarchy in England, and thus the conquest, subjugation, Anglicization, and Protestantization of Ireland became the priority for English security, especially under Elizabeth I, following her excommunication by Pope Pius V in 1570. The First Desmond War from 1569 to 70, and the Second Desmond War from 1579 to 83, in which Irish Catholic Confederates sought help from Philip II, heightened English fears of Spain acquiring Ireland as a bridgehead. And there is Dingle in County Kerry, the old Spanish pier where the trawlers are moored. And that is where Gonzalo Fernández de Córdoba signed the treaty on behalf of Charles V and I with the Earl of Desmond on the 28th of April. 1529. Rights and privileges of the Irish in the Spanish Habsburg territories were renewed in their confirmations by subsequent Spanish monarchs. And there you have a view of Ireland with the different lordships, and you can see the great earldom of Desmond in the south there, and the O'Donnell lordship up in the north. And that area around Dublin called the Pale, that was the effective area of English rule in the country at that time. So they were very anxious to prevent a continental power from combining with any of the great Irish lords in the south and west in taking Ireland out of English control. And here you have a wonderful medallion of Philip I and Mary I, King and Queen of Ireland, that's Philip II of Spain, but he was our Philip I. This was in the period from 1554 to 1558. Those four years, ladies and gentlemen, were the only period of peace and prosperity and stability in 16th century Ireland. And so there is a deep regard for Philip. And there is another view of the Spanish peer in Dingle where Spanish and papal troops arrived with the Captain General of Desmond, James Fitzmaurice Fitzgerald, in July 1579. This connects with the Armada story of 1588 in the person of Don Juan Martinez de Ricalde, the Vice Admiral of the Armada. He was the one who brought those Spanish and papal troops to Dingle in 1579, and his knowledge of the coast stood him well in his remarkable um, activities in rescuing a number of Spanish ships and equipment and artillery and bringing them back to Spain safely. We should also remember here that there were eight Irish navigational pilots, including Simon Skiddy, Santa Cruz's fa favorite pilot, who became Medina Sidonia's pilot on his flagship. There were 30 Irish noblemen mostly what we call the Geraldine exiles from Desmond in the south, 
taking the name of Fitzgerald, was the family name, each attended by one or three servants. And there were over 1,000 Irish veteran troops in the army of Flanders who were to be deployed in Ireland and secure it and from there open up a second front in Wales once Parma's main force landed in Kent. One of the most famous contemporary accounts by a Spanish survivor of the Armada of 1588 is that of Captain Francisco de Cuellar. In his memoir of the scenes that he witnessed when he came ashore at Strida Strand in County Sligo, a careful reading of it reveals that he differentiated between the local poor who scavenged the shoreline and robbed the dead, but who nevertheless helped survivors escape from the English soldiers and their hired professional killers of Irish origin, and the names of Melachlan Macab and Boethius Clancy, William Burke of Ardnery, and Duv Dara Rua O'Reilly, or sorry, O'Malley. They are recorded in various English and Irish sources as having joined the Lord Deputy Fitzwilliam and Richard and George Bingham in the slaughter of the shipwrecked survivors who came ashore in counties Clare, Galway, Mayo, Sligo, and Donegal. Five names inscribed in the Book of the Damned in Ireland, ladies and gentlemen. And in Munster, the local English governor, Sir Edward Denny, and his wife, Margaret, are recorded for having hanged those Armada survivors whom they had captured. Yet, the graves of the Armada dead are still known in Ireland by names such as Tuim na Spoinig, the tomb of the Spanish, or Uig na Spoinach, the Spaniard's grave or Knock na Spoinig, the burial mound of the Spanish, or Laba na Spoinach, the resting place of the Spaniard. And the centuries-old tradition of local people offering prayers for their souls every September still continues. Yet many survivors from the wreckage on Irish coasts were treated well and given shelter, comfort, protection, and transport to Scotland, from whence they continued to Flanders and then to Spain. And their accounts, including that of the aforementioned de Cayar, reveal many interesting details about the socio-economic and political conditions of North Connacht and Ulster, and about the people in that region. Some of those whom de Cuellar described as, quote, some sort of Christian or salvajes. Now, as the decrees of the Council of Trent had not yet been promulgated in Ireland at that time, and due to the English persecution and unstable situation for the Irish Catholic Church, it is understandable that someone like de Coyar, who came from a Spain which had already introduced the reforms of Trent, noticed that his co-religionists in Ireland did not fully conform with the standards of the Spanish Catholic Church, but yet he recognized that they shared his faith. As for de Coyar's use of the word salvaje, it should not be interpreted in the modern contemporary sense that is negative. In the context of that word's use during the 16th and 17th centuries, the Renaissance ideal of the noble savage or an exotic natural creature untouched by modern sophistication is what was intended. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Though the cold, wet climate and wild terrain of Ireland's northwest could hardly meet the pleasures of the Garden of Paradise, we know from de Coyar's account that he enjoyed some comforting tenderness with a few of those salvajes. Indeed, Coyar recounts that he wondered 
if the prospect of being married to an Irish nobleman's sister was more dangerous than falling into the hands of the English. Foremost among the Irish who risked their lives and properties in order to help the survivors escape were Lady Gronya Iwoila or Grace O'Malley, Lord Mara Nadua O'Flaherty, Lord MacWilliam Burke, Lord O'Rourke of Brefney, Lord McClancy, Lord Maguire of Fermanagh, Lord O'Doherty of Inishown, Lord O'Cahan, Lord Sorla Bui MacDonald, Lord James MacDonald, and Bishop Redmond O'Gallagher of Derry, and Bishop Cornelius O'Devany of Down and Connor, and Lord Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone. Meanwhile, some Spanish officers, such as Pedro Blanco, decided to remain in Ulster with O'Neill in order to train his followers in modern military techniques. And the fruits of their labor would soon become evident in O'Neill's and O'Donnell's campaigns against the English during the Nine Years' War from 1594 to 1603 that culminated in another Spanish-Irish alliance at Kinsale in 1601. Within the following 20 years, those Irish notables who had helped the Armada survivors to escape would be exiled or executed by the English. On the 1st of February 1612, the English would complete their revenge on those notables with the public execution of Bishop O'Devany, then an octogenarian, on the charge that he had assisted the Crown's Spanish enemies to escape. And this, ladies and gentlemen, happened despite the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1604. Apart from slaughtering the sh captured shipwrecked survivors, the English authorities were anxious to seize guns, weaponry, treasure, and other goods from the shipwrecks. Many local scavengers were arrested, their booty confiscated, and some of them were even killed. The English governor of Connacht, Sir George Bingham, managed to recover some small cannon, weaponry, and artifacts from the wrecks of El Gran Grin and the Falco Blanco Mediano. Meanwhile, his colleague, Sir George Carew, Master of Ordnance, tried to recover cannon from the San Marcos de Portugal that sank off the coast of County Clare, a place ever since known as Spanish Point. Carew had some limited excess, success, and in a report to Fitzwilliam, he noted that it was a very difficult task of sustaining the divers with copious drafts of Ishkabaha. Ishkabaha, ladies and gentlemen, is Irish whiskey. And here, the image of Bunratty Castle in County, Clare, in County Clare. This is the seat of the O'Brien Earldom of Thomond at that time. We have one of the relics of that ship, uh, the San Marcos. This is known as the Armada Table. And you will see there uh, the details. Point there. This is, oh, sorry. You see there are, this one here, you see the details there, these are carvings from various parts of the ship, these lovely heraldic lines holding shields bearing the arms of Castile and Aragon, etc. And they were placed underneath then this Renaissance marquetry top. So this is a composition of various pieces of salvage from the Armada wreck. The English were not interested in the woodwork. They were only interested in taking the cannon. But O'Brien recovered these pieces, and so they decorate the great hall here in Bunratty Castle in County Clare. And also, you will see there uh, these uh, um, carvings of angels uh, with Irish deer antler attached to them, and they're used as um, 
chandeliers in the castle. So you can see the use to which some of these Armada artifacts were put. And so we move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, having mentioned Irish whiskey, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with its warming qualities for medicinal purposes in cold weather, perhaps it is appropriate at this point in my presentation to speak about the archaeological evidence. Any archaeologist involved in sub-aqua operations will testify to the necessity of having a little glass of Irish whiskey when they surface from the cold, watery depths. So while the general locations of several Armada wrecks are widely known, and commemorated in names such as Carig Nespoinig, the rocks of the Spanish, or Perth Nespoinig, the rocky shore of the Spanish, or Spanish Point or Spanish Cave. It was not until June of 1967 that the Belgian professional diver and researcher of historical shipwrecks, Robert Stenuit, visited the wreck site of La Girona on the North Antrim coast. And there he found two bronze cannon complete with breech locks and some coins. The following year, in April of 1968, he returned with the expert photographer, Mark Yashinsky, and a full team of divers with serious equipment. Over two diving missions involving two seasons and 6,000 hours of diving, their excavation produced two pieces of bronze cannon, a large assortment of navigational equipment, some small arms, fragments of decorated silverware, 405 gold coins, 756 silver coins, as well as 115 copper coins. Yet the most spectacular discovery was of Renaissance-style jewelry gold chains and rings, pendants and crosses of the chivalric orders of Santiago and of Malta. Fortunately, these salvaged items were not sold off at auction to the highest bidder, nor sold to private collectors. Instead, the collection was sold to the Ulster Museum in Belfast at an agreed valuation. This had set a precedent as subsequently other items from the wreck were also sold to the museum. That year, 1969, also saw the troubles in Northern Ireland erupt into almost 30 years of violence. Hence, this discovery became overshadowed in terms of media coverage at that time. And there you see a golden salamander with rubies. And this is the pendant cross of the Order of Santiago, which probably belonged to Don Alonso Martinez de Leva de Rioja. He had brought 700 of his men across the northwest of Ireland up to Killybegs, and from there they sailed on the Girona, bound for Scotland, having repaired it in the O'Donnell territory. But they were shipwrecked in another storm off the Antrim coast in Northern Ireland. So that's a separate jurisdiction from the Republic. So there is another uh, example. It's a gold receptacle for an Agnes Day sacramental. And there are some gold buttons from a doublet and silver table forks. Earlier in 1963, another search began for the wreck of the Santa Maria de la Rosa in the Blasket Sound in the southwest of Ireland in County Kerry, there off the Dingle Peninsula. The surviving eyewitness account of its sinking, written by Don Marcos de Aramburo, who was on the San Juan Bautista of the Castilian squadron, as well as the account of its sole survivor, a Genoese cabin boy named Giovanni, who was captured and interrogated by Sir Edward Denny, did not provide details of its precise location. Therefore, after a number of exploratory dives in the swift and dangerous currents at the northern entrance to the sound, and there you see it, it was not until the summer of 1968 
the same time that La Girona was being excavated, that the British adventurer, explorer, and novelist Sidney Wignall discovered four anchors, a ballast mound, and some piles of iron shot, lead musket shot, and six of the classic Armada's lead ingots. In 1969, Wignall and his team, including Colin Martin, returned to the site with a 16-meter diving boat. Though they had found large amounts of iron shot, or cannonballs, they failed to find any cannon. Thus, they thought that maybe they had discovered the San Juan Bautista that had been commanded by Don Fernando Jora. Its main mast was shattered, and the Vice Admiral Don Juan Martinez de Ricalde supervised the transfer of its cannon and crew onto his flagship, the San Juan de Portugal, which was the vice flagship of the Lusitanian squadron. Then Ricalde ordered that Horas San Juan Bautista be scuttled. So that amazing feat was described accurately in Aramburu's eyewitness account. Recalde had four ships with him in the Blasket Sound, and there they sheltered from the storms, they took on water from the locality and supplies, carried out repairs to the ships, but the uh, San Juan of Jora's uh, command was so badly damaged that Recalde ordered it to be scuttled, but before it was, the cannons were transferred onto his ship. Now, this was an amazing feat to be carried out in such difficult circumstances. Now, Wignall and his team, they had hoped to find the Santa Maria de la Rosa because it had sunk with all its cannon, all its treasure. And some time later, two pewter plates inscribed with the name Matute in Roman style capital letters were produced by Wignall. He claimed that since the documentary evidence in Samanca states that the infantry captain Francisco Ruiz Matute was on the muster list of the Santa Maria de la Rosa, that this wreck must therefore be of that ship and not of the scuttled San Juan. Among the items recovered were the remains of several arquebuses, a larger board musket, and the legs, pelvis, and ribs of some unfortunate man who apparently was crushed to death by ballast when the ship sunk. Very little else was found. Like Stenuit, Wignall sold these items to the Ulster Museum. Yet there are some questions or reservations raised over the authenticity of the two plates inscribed with the name Matute. It seems rather unusual for someone in the 16th century, least of all a non-noble, to have their name engraved on pewter plates. There are no records of Denny or anyone else having recovered cannon from the Santa Maria de la Rosa during the intervening centuries. According to Aramburu, that ship immediately sank with everyone and everything aboard. He was mistaken in one small detail. The Genoese cabin boy Giovanni, who had washed ashore and under interrogation mentioned that he was the only survivor of that ship. So, there is a question mark now being raised. Did Wignall really find the Santa Maria de la Rosa, or was it the scuttled ship, the San Juan Bautista? In February of 1971, the Sub-Aqua Club of Derry inadvertently discovered the wreck of La Trinidad Valencera in Kinago Bay in County Donegal's north coast. And Colin Martin of St. Andrews University in Scotland was invited to be 
the archaeological director of the club's recovery of items from that wreck site. Now, the cooperation of Derry Sabakwa Club's conservation support from the Ulster Museum and facilities provided by McGee College in Derry and financial sponsorship from allied Irish banks was a testimony to the level of cooperation from both sides of the border. The Irish government agreed that the recovered items be preserved and maintained in the Ulster Museum. The most notable feature of this recovery was the preservation of organic materials from the ship, including textiles of wool, silk, and velvet, a tent, and various items of furniture. In 1985, a group of British divers led by Stephen Birch, Alan King, and Henry Chapman located the Armada shipwrecks of La Juliana, La Labia Benetiana, and Santa Maria de Vision at Strida in County Sligo. The aforementioned captain, Francisco de Coyar, provided a vivid account of the fate of these ships as he had been aboard La Labia Benetiana when it was shipwrecked there. With help from ro local people, he had managed to escape Fitzwilliams and Bingham soldiers, found refuge with Lord McClancy's castle at Rosclocher in County Leitrim, and where he and fellow Spaniards recovered and later returned to Spain with the help of Bishop O'Gallagher of Derry. So the effects of a recent storm in Strida had shifted a sandbank and exposed a large section of La Juliana on the seabed. A group of British-led divers found four bronze cannons, three gun carriages, two anchors, a large rudder, some structural timbers, and large amounts of lead, iron, and stone shot. They brought three of the cannons to the surface, and one of them bore the image of San Severo, the martyr bishop of the early church in Barcelona. And this again is where the archaeology and the historical archival research combine wonderfully. In that archival research in Spain corroborated the identity of the wreck as that of La Juliana. It had been constructed as an armed merchant ship in Mataro in 1570 for the Pilau family, one of the mercantile patriciate of Barcelona. Later in 2015, when the Underwater Archaeology Unit of the Irish National Monument Service recovered six more bronze cannon from that wreck, they bore the date of their casting, 1570. And the letter D at the touch hole signified that the cannons had been cast by that famous gun foundry of the Dorino family in Genoa. Also in 1985, the wreck of the Santa Maria de Vision was identified by a bronze barrel of an Esmeril, this is a breech-loading swivel gun, engraved with the royal arms of King Philip II. And later in 2015, it was recovered with two breech blocks by the National Monument Service Underwater Archaeology Unit. And these are now conserved in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. And in this regard, I want to make it very clear to you all that the Irish National Monument Service Underwater Archaeology Unit has received wonderful cooperation from ARCWA, their Spanish colleagues, Cartagena, in identifying various objects, but also in regards to their restoration. The Irish government recognize under international law that these armada wrecks belong to the Spanish state. And under the understanding that exists between both Ireland and Spain, the Irish are custodians of these treasures of the armada with the permission of the Spanish state, and they will not be sold, they will be preserved and displayed properly with Spanish cooperation and advice, of course. And that is the situation that exists. 
And this is a very, very important issue, as you all are aware, for Spain's cultural heritage, especially that lies underwater in various places around the world. So as you can see, even that ancient friendship that existed between Ireland and Spain in the 16th century continues today with regards to the recovery of these treasures from the Armada wrecks and their preservation, etc., in Ireland. In 1987, the wreck site of La, La Via Veneziana was identified by a Falco Pedrero. This is a short muzzle loading gun bearing the heraldic arms of the La Via family of Venice, the ship's original owners. And the detailed decoration on the gun is very similar to the designs on other ordnance cast in the Venetian foundry of the Alberghetti family and two wooden gun carriages with their bronze cannons were also discovered at the site of La Labia, but I'm informed that they still await recovery and conservation. In the aftermath of the discovery of objects from the Armada wreck sites in the Blasket Sound in County Kerry, and at Kinnego Bay in Donegal, and their subsequent transfer out of the jurisdiction of the Republic of Ireland into that of Northern Ireland, there had been considerable public annoyance and criticism at what was perceived to be political indifference to Irish national heritage. Now that was over 40 years ago. And that was a time when the controversial modern office block developments caused the destruction of the ancient Viking site at Wood Quay in Dublin, as well as the obliteration of much of the city's 18th century neoclassical buildings. Also during that time, political and sectarian violence in Northern Ireland in the 1970s and 80s became intense, and the Ulster Museum in Belfast, with its treasures from the Armada, did not attract many visitors from the Republic. Therefore, under immense public pressure by the mid-1980s, the Irish government took a more interested and proactive role in preserving national monuments and heritage. And in this scenario, the British team of divers who had recovered items from the Armada Rex in Strida, in Sligo, was refused license to export the items for sale. After a lengthy period of litigation, that culminated in the Supreme Court of Ireland, the British diving team's claim to be salvors in possession was denied by the Supreme Court. And its judge's verdict favored the Irish state, but they criticized the state for being remiss or neglectful in its duty of care to the wreck sites as it did not have the requisite capacity to dive, survey, manage, and protect such sites. So in compliance with the Supreme Court's ruling and recommendations of 1995, the Irish state made a goodwill settlement with the British diving team who had assumed the name of the Strida Armada Group. And in 2006, the group submitted a final report on its activity to the government. Thereby, the Irish National Museum acquired custody of the cannon and other artifacts that had been recovered from the Armada Rex at Strida. The judgment brought about the enactment of the National Monuments Amendment Act in 1987, which protects Irish underwater cultural heritage, including wrecks over 100 years old. One of its consequences was the establishment by the Office of Public Works of an underwater archaeological unit within the National Monument Service in 1997. And since then, this unit has undertaken the more recent investigations and discoveries in 2015, as well as the recovery and conservation of key artifacts from the wreck of La Juliana, particularly 15 bronze cannon that probably, uh, oh yes, that, that bear the images of martyr saints and curiously, a Turkish cannon that probably had been taken as a prize from the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. 
We know that La Juliana had seen action at Lepanto that year. So the National Museum of Ireland now preserves one of the largest and most impressive collections of artillery from the Armada of 1588. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I come to another point relating back to the first part of my lecture about propaganda and how empirical evidence from archaeology combined with serious historical analysis counters the mythologies of the Armada. In terms of the analysis, the scientific analysis of the recovered items from the Armada wrecks on the Irish coast, the archaeological evidence as well as the documentary details in the inventories for each ship of the Great Armada of 1588 corroborate, corroborate each other in confirming that this large-scale enterprise was well equipped and well supplied in terms of weaponry, artillery, and importantly, compatible ammunition and shot. And this contradicts the claims of some Anglophone historians, particularly these so-called popular historians, that the Armada was ill-equipped and that its ammunition was incompatible with the caliber of its gunnery. However, it is true that fresh water and fresh biscuit was in short supply. And even the correspondence of the Armada's commander, Medina Sidonia, as well as the testimonies of various survivors, such as Cuellar Aramburu and the doomed Genoese cabin boy Giovanni, bear out the fact that much of the food and water supplies had spoiled due to the various delays before the Armada had finally sailed into English waters. But then, Medina Sidonia and others had thought that when they would coordinate with Parma's troops in Flanders, that they would take on fresh supplies. But as we know, the fates decided otherwise. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to c conclude here by showing you what is probably the only Armada Memorial dedicated to the Armada dead in the world here at Strida in County, Dun in County Sligo on the southern shore of Donegal Bay. And there you see this beautiful memorial in stone and it's built like the prow of a ship facing out into the bay itself. And every year the 21st of September is the autumn equinox, and it was the autumn equinoctial storms that had destroyed these ships on the Irish coast. And so, on the 21st of September, or on the weekend closest to it, there is an annual commemoration of the Armada dead at Strida. A thousand wooden crosses representing each victim are planted in the sand. As we know that about a thousand died there, either drowned or killed when they came ashore by the English. And there you see people planting the crosses, and some members of the Irish Navy as well as members of the Spanish Navy present at the commemorations. These are in behind the sand dunes at the memorial itself, which is near the burial mound where the Spanish Armada dead lay to rest. And as you can see, this ceremony is attracting people not only from Spain every year, but this year in September of, nine, of 2019, there were over 700 people present, not just only Irish, the majority were Irish, but we had visitors from Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and even one Dane. 
So, some of these people told us that they had ancestors who had been in the Armada. It's interesting that the family memory had kept that alive down through the centuries for them. And they were very pleased to discover on the internet that this annual commemoration takes place up in County Sligo. You might even recognize some people in these photos. There we have His Excellency, the Ambassador of Spain, Don Ildefonso Castro Lopez, speaking at the Armada Memorial this year on the 21st of September. And that's Councillor Mark McSharry, who represents the local government there. He's also a member of the Irish Parliament. So as you can see, this is a very important event. So you might like to inscribe it in your diaries for next year. And there you see again, yes, I know it's all very deceptive. The earlier photographs I showed you had lovely clear blue skies. But ladies and gentlemen, if you want four seasons in one day, come to Ireland. <laughs> because there you see up to the north, across Donegal Bay to the mountains of Donegal in the distance, the storm clouds were gathering once again on the 21st of September. So, but the rain held off and the sun came out again and there you see some other views. And the Spanish Navy always send a representative party uh, for these events and it's wonderful to see the Armada Española in Kilibegs in Donegal Bay because right through the 16th century, the Spanish Armada had been sending supplies of arms and ammunition and money to the O'Donnells and the O'Neills through Kilibegs in their struggles uh, against Elizabeth I. And this is the Sentinela which had come this year. And there you see another commemorative concert, the De Coyar Suite, composed by Michael Rooney in 2010. This is a wonderful suite of music, ladies and gentlemen, and you can check it out on YouTube if you Google it, and you will see there are performances of it on YouTube, and um, you can get in contact with the composer as well, as he has CDs of this marvelous suite. And this is performed every year in the local church at Grange in County Sligo. And as you can see there on the altar again, a galleon, a model of a galleon, as this is all part of a weekend of commemorations, etc. So, as I said, 1594 saw the next phase of this Spanish engagement in Ireland not that long after the Armada. And Spanish support for the Irish Catholic Confederation led by Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, and Red Hugh O'Donnell, Earl of Tyrconnell. And their relatives are here with us in the audience this evening. Arms, money, ammunition, and troops were sent by Philip uh, to the Irish. He accepted the offer of the Irish throne from them just before his death in 1598, and his son, Philip III, continued his Irish, or his father's Irish policy and patronage and had accepted the offer of the Irish throne as well. Don Pedro de Zubiaur and Don Diego de Brochero commanded the naval squadrons that brought Spanish troops and supplies to the force at Kinsale under the command of Don Juan del Aquila and to the forces at Don Boy and Arde castles under the command of Donald Calm O'Sullivan Bear. These are the three great figures in terms of the Armada's history and its connections with Ireland. Álvaro de Bazán had first proposed the idea of a great enterprise against England after his campaign in the Azores in, in 1583. And there was a large contingent of Irish troops with him on that campaign, as well as Irish navigational pilots. And he, in his original plan, had suggested the Armada sail straight to Ireland and land troops and men and ammunition there combine with the Irish and start the campaign against England there to distract the English troops in Flanders away and thereby allow Parma to consolidate his position in Flanders and from there invade England. 
But as we know, Parma had other ideas and suggested that the Armada would come to the Flemish coast and that they would jointly face the Thames estuary and take London instead. Juan Martinez de Ricalde, the Vice Admiral of the Armada, also, like Bathan, was keen on the original plan of taking Ireland first. Bazan and Martinez de Recalde were very familiar with the Irish. Recalde was very familiar with the Irish coast and that came very, very, shall we say, useful, that information that he had for him in bringing his own ships safely back to Spain. And then another one of their associates who would continue the idea of linking Ireland into Spain was the Diego de Brochero Paz y Anaya. He was the titular prior of Ireland in the sovereign order of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta. And Brochero had noticed the skills of Irish seamanship and galley warfare, etc., from his experiences in Ireland. And he was the great patron of the Irish refugees coming to Spain after Kinsale at the beginning of the 17th century and was appointed to the official position of protector of the Irish at the Spanish court. And it was he who opened up careers for Irishmen into the Armada Española. And right through the records of the Armada Española in the 17th into the 18th centuries, we see considerable numbers of Irishmen and people of Irish origin in the service of Spain. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that my presentation's concentration on the evidence from a range of archival as well as from archaeological analysis of recovered items, including artillery and ammunition, has provided you with some new perspectives and food for thought. We should always remember that only less than one third of the Armada of 1588 was lost on the coasts of Scotland and Ireland. Given the difficult circumstances on board the ships and the unusually violent equinoctial storms of September 1588, it is a most remarkable, indeed outstanding achievement that two thirds of the Armada and its personnel, battered but intact, returned to Spain. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a testimony to the endurance as well as the brilliant navigational skills of Spanish mariners in 1588. They are the unsung heroes of that enterprise and all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is a factual historical point of which Spain can be justly proud. Thank you.